But at the end of the day, you know, we we want to do a good job. We want to make sure everybody's happy, everything works. Business of Architecture, episode 407. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Eugene Kohlberg, an architect with 25 years experience producing award-winning architecture and interiors in the US and internationally. They are based in New York and Eugene has designed many environmentally sensitive residential projects. He's directed projects at recognized New York institutions and he's helped master plan higher education campuses nationwide. His retail projects have been incredibly successful and have dovetailed architectural design and brand identity and, of course, architectural expression. Um, and in this conversation, I speak with Eugene about the genesis of his business, how he markets and goes to find new clients, and how he has been maintaining uh, client relationships, and also how he has been navigating the challenges of a relatively young and growing architecture practice. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Eugene Kohlberg. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Eugene, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Great. I'm happy to be here. Fantastic. Very excited to have you on the show. Yeah. So you are the founder of Kohlberg Architecture. Um, you've got nearly nearly 30 years of experience. Um, you, you founded the practice in 2016, I understand. Correct, yeah. You were trained, in, trained at Cornell. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a lead green associate, you're NCARB certified, and Kohlberg has become one of the you know, really interesting and exciting multidisciplinary practices based in Brooklyn. Uh, you guys have got quite an extensive portfolio, single family work, multifamily, yeah. retail, um, and also workplace. Um, so Yeah, we've been busy. I suppose <laughs> you've been, it's, it's a lot, yeah. it's a lot there. Yeah. Um, and I, I was actually, just before this, I was watching another interview with you on YouTube and you were talking about this t kind of 10-year period yeah. where what, what it takes to learn how to attract and retain clients. Right. So I suppose let's, let's jump, in, jump in there and, and ask that question. Like, well, what, does that, what does that mean for you? Well, I think... I think the one, the, the conversation that you're referring to was that, you know, back in, I think it was 2004, um, I was five-ish, six years out of school. Um, and I realized I, I was working in a great office, kind of medium-sized office in New York, which did everything under the sun. Um, mm -hmm. And I was working on... I was working on an art gallery and in Chelsea and I was working on a workplace project, um, mostly by myself. Um, you know, there was some principal oversight and stuff here and there, but, uh, you know, I, the, the, the size of the project and the scope of the project was, was enough for one person. Um, yeah. and I, you know, I sort of had a eureka moment, like, hold on a second, I can do this by myself like this infrastructure is yeah you know not, not requirements obviously welcome right to have somebody to bounce ideas from but i figured you know what if i can do these two projects these two projects take i don't know six weeks to design eight weeks to design you know, probably three months to build um so in six months the fee of those projects to that office were mm -hmm twice my yearly salary. So I'm like, hold on a second. I mean, granted, not, you know, not understanding overhead costs and insurance costs and, you know, sure. office rent and all of that, but just on, on a very basic level, I'm like, hold on a second. Not only can I do this myself, 
just the, the kind of the day-to-day things or tasks. But, yeah. but in half the time, I can make twice as much money, mm-hmm. generally speaking. Um, so that's when I figured, okay, well, you know, this is something and, and, and there were cool projects, right? Um, so this is something that I want to figure out how, how to do kind of going forward. And it did take me, and the only thing I didn't understand, didn't have, I think the mechanism wasn't there was to just attract that new business. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, from that year on, I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to make that a priority. Yeah. Um, and try and figure out how that works. Um, well, that, that's very interesting. That kind of realization, if you like, when you as in an employee scenario realize, you know, what somebody's charging you out at or the fees that yeah, no, I mean, I, bringing in. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of knew. I was, I was also fortunate to be working on business development for the office at yeah. that time. Um, I was one of the youngest people, so I, I was like by default the one who knew all of the Adobe programs. Um, and, <laughs> and sort of by default, I was the one who did like all the promo pages and stuff. Um, so, I, you yeah. know, so I had the, the opportunity to work on proposals and to work on, on business development. So I sort of knew what – was going on, but it was always a bigger team of people, right? These two projects, which were, um, which were on the smaller end of things, they were kind of short in terms of time span. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, but yeah, that realization was like, hold on, like just the sort of the basic math here is, is something that, that we need to take a look at. Yeah. Yeah, and it it's it, it's it is. It's very interesting when you kind of start looking yeah. at it and you start seeing the potential. Well, ex- and then obviously ex- when you exactly, it's it's seeing the potential. Obviously, you know, I I was young enough and I didn't realize that there's insurance costs and office and you know utilities and printers and software and all of that that goes into it. Health insurance, um, you know, whatever it is, right? So that. You know, you've got to add it back into the formula, but just on a very, very basic level, it was a, it was a confidence boost one, because I was doing mm. these by myself mostly. Um, and then, you know, I'm like, Oh, okay, hold on. If I start putting the pieces together, the only kind of missing link here is, is the, the, the mechanism to get clients or to get projects. Yeah. Yeah. And and so how did you, when you first started up your business, how did you win those initial projects, and what and what kind of sector were they in? Um, well, so I, I've always done independent work, um, whether it was helping other people um, that had smaller offices or sort of colleagues that had gone on their own and sort of had reached back and was like, hey, can you? You know, can you help us in this small project? Can you do this? Can you do that on a, on a freelance basis? Um, and then at some point I started, you know, like it, it's the it's the sort of like, oh, okay, well, they would get a, pro-, you know, then, then those people were a little too big. And then a smaller project came in and they were like, well, we kind of don't have time to do it. But, you know, this person has been helping us and, he, you know, he, can, he might be interested. Um, so there were those type of projects, um, you know, in there somewhere, I also got my, my architecture license. Um, so that sort of helped that opened up an avenue of, of projects. So it was not only I was doing work for people on a freelance basis, but I also could take my own projects. Um, and then, you know, it's incredible how just sort of word gets around. Right. And, and how everybody is always looking for, for help, right? Like it's, Mm. um, just friends of friends or, or sort of friends of clients or not clients, but like, you know, consultants, right? Like I would get one or two calls here and there from, you know, consultants that are working on bigger projects. It's like, Oh, Hey, I want to renovate my apartment. You know, is that something that, that you can do, or, you know, somebody that can do it. I mean, a lot of times they're like, "Hey, yeah. do you know do you know somebody that can do this?" And I'm like, "Oh, hold on a second, I can do it." Um, <laughs> and you know, so one thing leads to another, um, and then 
at some point, um, you know, there, there's a momentum there, or at least what happened to me was that there's a momentum that you can't keep doing the sort of the moonlighting and, and your, you know, you can't do your side hustle and your real hustle at the same time. So there's a momentum there that shifts and that's, that happened for me in 2016. Right. Um, I see. I and see. then okay. I was so, like, okay, so you... well, you know, it's time, it's time to, to pull the plug and get real. The, the, my, um, the partner that I was working under at the architecture office that I was, was very, very, very happy for me. And he was very gracious. And he was like, I am ecstatic. You're going to kick ass. Um, and we're still friends, right? Which is great. I mean, that's the, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Um, it's like, we don't, we really like to work with nice people and we really mm -hmm. like to make people happy. And we don't necessarily like working with people with an attitude or sort of with jerks. So we surround ourselves with, um, you know, people that want to do good people that are sort of that like what they're doing. Um, and it's good to not burn any bridges as, as you go through life and your career, right? Because you never know when so, when you need to reach out to somebody or when, you know, somebody can help. When So when was that point that you, that you knew was the right time to go full in, that this could no longer be a side hustle anymore? Was there, some, was there, a, a, was there a particular trigger or an event that happened? Well, we, we, had, we had recently gotten a project um, a, a condominium project in New York. Um, so it was no longer like, Oh, you know, here's a retail store that needs a change of use or, you know, an mm -hmm. apartment renovation or a townhouse renovation, or, um, you know, this was a legitimate, I forget, I forget what it was, 80,000 square feet project, 12 story building. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's, it's time, <laughs> um, you know, but, but again, I mean, I think that the different, <clears throat> the different experiences that I had in different offices sort of, I guess, unconsciously were, were leading to that moment. Right. Um, and, and in all of them, I had the fortune of being given a very long leash in terms of responsibility and team management right. and design and so on. Um, you know, I think sometimes people didn't care necessarily about those projects that I was doing. Um, I would like to think that people had a lot of confidence in me. Um, whatever the case was, I had the fortune of, of having long leash, which which led to like, okay, well, in the cases of the bigger projects, I had to organize my teams in terms of production mm -hmm. and design and so on. I had to, I was the main um, contact with the client. I was the main contact with the consultants, um, you know, and it, it, it was great, right? And and if it and if it wasn't for this project that was sort of the catalyst of the of the change in momentum, I would still be there, and I would still be doing the same thing, which was great. Um, but um, but yeah, that was the that was the tipping point. How how big is Kohlberg now? We range. Depending on, I mean, with the pandemic and everybody's working remote and I mean, some people are back, some people are, but we are like between three and five people. Right. Got it. Um, and, so it depends. And, and yeah. when, no, go for it. When did you, when did you first start bringing on your own full-time employees? Um, probably about two years in, um, right. you know, and it was a combination of, of, and, and it was, and it's, you know, and it's hard finding, finding good talent. Um, and, and I also, you know, on the previous offices, I was also in charge of that aspect within the office. Right. So I sort of knew, I sort of knew where to go you know, do, do the right kind of posting, you know, what's the right type of, of help that you need? Cause that's also part of it, right? It's like, you need to understand, you need to really know what you need. And then you really need to know you, 
you need to understand what are the capacities of somebody, um, you know, that you're meeting, you know, for, you're talking to for half an hour to an hour, right? So in, in that short amount of time, you sort of have to understand, okay, well, this guy has the capacity or this person has the capacity to do this, that, and the other, or yeah. they sort of have the potential to do X or Y. Um, so what we did was we, we had a fortuitous uh, connection. One of our clients connected us to somebody um, who was looking um, and then that person started part-time and then full-time and then, you know, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think we, we've been incredibly lucky on, on certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some people will say that the people who work really hard get really lucky, but we work really hard. Yeah. Um, is it, so it wasn't kind of, um, shortly after you'd started working for yourself that you moved into the kind of multifamily residential world and you started taking on these bigger projects and that's quite a difficult sector to break into in, it's in a, new york yeah it's a diff yeah it's a difficult sector to break into but the the projects themselves are not complicated right, right. it's not it's not like you're doing it's not like you're doing a hospital it's not like you're doing a museum or a performing mm -hmm. arts center where there's these just sort of gigantic coordination requirements or these sort of the 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 efforts are monumental because you're trying to do these iconic buildings and you know all of this mm -hmm. which was great and i'd done those in the past and you know we i was working on a project um for a new hospital building in in new york some years before in another office and our team was about 40 people Right. And, but it was a, you know, the building was a, almost a million square feet in size. But when you do a multifamily residential project, especially of the scale of eight, 10, 12, you know, 18, maybe 20 stories, there's a lot mm -hmm. of repetition that's going on. Yep. Um, it's, it's something that's very formulaic in terms of the layout. Right. There's, there's, right. there's very specific, proven kind of time proven strategies that work that everybody knows that they work yep. and the more you you veer away from those the less successful you're going to be right and then the more time you're going to be hitting your head against the wall because there's a reason why people keep doing it because they work um yeah. and and it's about and, it, and it's one of the one of the nice things about the multifamily projects is that they give you the opportunity to understand kind of how systems work, not in not in the way of like how a building system works, but like for example, it's like, okay, if I make all the bathrooms the same, or if I make three types of kitchens or two types of kitchens, like if I can control that, you know, what is everything else around, you know, in terms of planning and in terms of design mm -hmm. and production and so on, it's like, how, how can we make not only the building efficient, but the process efficient, right? And at the end of the day, you know, to do one of these multifamily buildings, whether rental or condo, at that size, you don't need that many people. You need, yeah. you, need you know, one person full-time, maybe one and a half people working on it. Um, and in, in that, that's all it takes, right? The, 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 it's not a complicated building. It's, it's, it's an interesting building. Um, it's also a building type that I think a lot of people can relate to because when you're designing an apartment, you're like, okay, well, how does my apartment suck and how can I make it better? And, um, within those, those heavily, um, predetermined, uh, proportions and dimensions and all of that, how can we make it, you know, and it's, it's a matter of like, where can we inject special moments or, or, or mm. special features that will make it stand out. Right. In New York, especially Got it. So in New York, especially when there's, you know, an infinite amount of buildings, rental buildings specifically, it's like, what makes it stand out, um, from the next one? 
So do you have a, a very good understanding then of the kind of target demographics, the rental demographics or the, the sort of buyer demographics for the client? E- and is that something that's part of your proposal or your well, so, or, or was it research that you've been building up? No, so like everything else, you know, doing one of these buildings, it's there's a bigger team involved, right? Um, and mm-hmm. one of the things that developers do is that they have real estate consultants um, when they are working through their their performers and their their different kind of pre development strategies. Um, they'll look at comps from other buildings and and demographics for that. Um, these rental consultants will say, okay, you know. Um, this is what we think the apartment mix should be X, X amount of two bedrooms, X amount of one bedrooms, X amount of studios, or, you know, depending on the location of the building, it might lead itself to more larger apartments for families or shares or smaller apartments. Um, so location has a lot to do with it. And even in the same neighborhood, um, you know, you might have an area of the neighborhood or a building that's geared towards families and another one that's geared towards towards younger professionals. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's a combination, right? I mean, you you have to be fast on your feet and understand what those different parameters are and be able to respond both um, in the planning stage and and as you you sort of work through the amenities and common areas and the sort of the general look and feel of the place. Um, But, you know, like everything else, it's a big team of people that, that help. Um, you mentioned there that your, your clients are often working with real estate consultants. Right. Is that something that you ever do as well to help you understand some of the, the business agenda that your developer clients are working their way through? No, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't hire real estate consultants ourselves. These are people that the, own, that the ownership group brings in. But one of the things that, um, you know, when I, was, when I was working at Gensler for a handful of years, one of the things that they sort of beat into our head is that you have to be, you have to be on in your client's shoes in order to understand, in order to fully understand where they're coming from, right? Um, yes. So it's like you need to read the same magazines that they read. You need to go to the same functions that they go. You need to go. You need to belong to the same professional networks because otherwise, if you don't, if you can't, um, not only understand where they're coming from, how they're thinking. Um, you can't really, I mean, ideally you're, you're sort of predicting you're ahead, you're one step ahead of them. Um, Mm -hmm. and you can have a, an intelligent conversation about whatever it is that, that they're doing. Right. So we, we try to have as many offline conversations and, and learn in the multifamily space as much as we can from, the developers and you know and and the, and the CMs too. Like the CMs do, their, their specific there's a specific group of construction managers that do a lot of these things, right? And so you try and yeah, you try and educate yourself before, during, and after the project to understand what you know. What are the implications? What went what went good in this building? What went bad? What you know? What were the mistakes? What were everything? And then you know you implement that on your on your projects. As a as a niche working in the multifamily residential sector and this p- specific type of developer, right. what different types of developers have you come across, and what are their common problems that you that you understand very well, or are able to help them with specifically? Well, I think that um, so so one thing that that we do, or one thing that we like to do is not be in a particular niche when it comes to project type. Um, right. We, we, we believe I was in most, most of my experience has been in offices that are sort of generalist practice. And, yeah. and I think there's, there's having, having the ability to work in different types of projects whether it's art galleries, offices, residential, townhouses, apartments. I was working in a cemetery once. Um, you know, all of that, all of that informs a, a sort of greater kind of understanding and perspective, right? Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's definitely the need for experts. 
right? And and you can go to different offices that are just, you know, totally just focused on, on one thing and, you know, and they can do it in their sleep. Um, but I think having a little bit of a different, having enough experience in each project type and, you know, and I'll be the first one to tell you, it's like, I've never done a stadium. I would love to do a stadium, but I don't know the first thing about building a stadium. Right. And meanwhile, you know, yeah. there's offices that just, you know, just turn those out like that. Um, whether the end product is good or bad, it's, you know, besides the point, but in terms of the sector, I think one asset that we bring, I think is that we not only are quick on our feet to understand the different requirements and, you know, and, and the different sort of benchmarks and milestones and all that. Um, but we bring a perspective from something else. So when we're talking about multifamily residential and common areas and something, we can always refer back, for example, the common areas or the siting or the placement of the building in relationship to like civic and public space, right? Because we, we have, or I yeah. have prior experience in that, right? And we always want to infuse our projects with that capacity. Um, you know, when it comes to the ground floor and that connection to the street, we've done enough retail projects that we know what works and what doesn't work for future tenants. I mean, in these right. buildings, you're always delivering vanilla boxes. Um, but we know those proportions, we know what works, we know what doesn't mm-hmm. work. Um, so that's, so that's, you know, we try and bring that perspective and that works for some people. It doesn't work for some people, right? Some people want to see it's like, Hey, show me the last five 20 story buildings that you've done. And we're like, well, we don't, we don't have five, we have two mm-hmm. or we have one. Right. But we have all of these things that we think are an asset to, to your project. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the developers, um, we work, the developers that we work with are not very big in size. Um, you know, okay. they're not, they're, they're, their offices are a similar size of ours, right? They're probably five, maybe 10 people. Um, and the, they're, um, they're sort of younger businesses. Um, and so we don't work. It's not that we don't like it. We just haven't had the opportunity to work with, you know, super large developers in New York where, where the competition is, is a lot more fierce. Um, and I think that regardless of the project, regardless of the office, it always goes back to personalities of the team. Mm -hmm. Right. So at some point, if you're, if you have a large office at the end of the day, it's going to be about that team that's working on your project. Um, so, so we think ourselves as, as sort of a small studio that, that can understand and relate to that smaller developer. We, we know, or we think we know their, their needs and wants and very easily can understand their perspective. Um, and I think we have a lot, a lot to bring to, to that conversation. Yeah. And um, how do you then, you know, you, it's very interesting you were saying, and, and, a, and a lot of architects will, I think, will agree with you on this about the importance of being able to um, have your feet in different sectors and the, the benefits that come from being able to work on a, on a kitchen extension and then working on, right. the, you know, like you said, like a cemetery or working on, f- from an architectural perspective, that's a very enriching process to our design intelligence it makes us better designers yeah i mean i think it's very enriching to the architect um yes and and i think it also lets you try different ideas in places where it might not not that it's as important but it might not be as consequential like if you're just trying to work out something about some cabinetry or whatever Mm -hmm. right like it might be easier to get away with something like that on on a single family house or an apartment renovation than something at scale of a building that has 100 units or yes or if you're trying to find some strategy you know it might be easier to develop it on a small retail store and then you know take some of those ideas and you know take them to different different places 
um, I think the, the downs. So that's that's the positive end of things. I think the downside is that we can't really compete with a truly, truly, truly expert in in that the, kind of subcategory. We we try. The, yeah, this, you know, this was going to be my next. Yeah, yeah. The, the next question is is how do you then you know when you know. It, there's the kind of being perceived as a generous right. generalist right. from the market. And then there's the danger of, you know, them valuing you like a commodity. And like, how do you, how do you stand out? How do you, you know, how, how, how do you, how do you kind of demonstrate that value to I would, I a would, client? I would think you want to stand out with potential as opposed to experience. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, right? Like, um, like I can, I cannot claim that you know our office is fifty people and we've done, sure, I don't know, seven different offices and we've done you know this and that and the other. But what I can say is like, look, you're getting me, you're getting my partner, you're getting the other the other folks that are in the office, and combined we have this unique. Not unique, but we have we have enough of a broad experience that we can figure something out, right? And it's and it and it most of the time it requires trust from the client, right? Because you don't yes. have the proven track record, so so it's about very quickly gaining that trust. Um, and you know, you either you either can can gain the trust by giving references that the the you know the prospective client can speak to. You can build trust by having visioning sessions um, or by sort of having um, consultation sessions early on. And they're like, okay, well, you know, well, let's figure this out together, right? Like what's, um, you know, what's the process here? Um, Or, you know, sometimes your fees lower. Um, And, you know, there's projects that we take with with a low fee in order to just, just sort of build a portfolio. Um, so it's a sort of a multi, multi pronged approach, but at the end of the day, the client and the rest of the team needs to have a certain level of trust. Um, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to, to gain, but it goes away like that. If you're not, if you don't, um, you know, if you don't live up to it. Right. So that's always that you know, that's always something that we want to make sure we, we keep hitting the mark. How, where does the majority of your work come from these days? Is it a lot, is it pr- primarily referral based and repeat clients? Yeah, most of it, yes. you, yeah, most of it is, most of it is word of mouth and most of it is, is repeat clients, which is great because that means we're doing a good job. Um, yeah. Or maybe, or maybe they don't have a choice. Maybe everybody else is too busy. I don't know. But I, I would like to think <laughs> that, that we're doing a good job. Um, we do get a lot of referrals from the different consultants that we work with um, that are like, hey, I remember. I mean, even consultants that, that I've worked with in previous offices and, you know, so five or ten years ago, so, oh, hey, I remember you did a good job in X. You know, yes. we have somebody that maybe use your help. And, and I think it, it, it helps to it helps to have a, a close knit whenever you can a close knit um, group of consultants that you keep going back to um, because the, you know, one of the things that's difficult on a project is in the start, you know, there's, there's a huge learning curve for everybody, right? If you've never worked before mm-hmm. with that other group or that other consultant or that other client, it, it takes a while. So not only are you trying to sort of mobilize and get off the ground and get things going, but you're also trying to understand what are the different deliverables? How do these people work? What do they expect? So it, you, it really, really helps to, to, as much as you can, keep using the same consultants because also you're generating that trust between the team. You know, you're, you don't have to reinvent the wheel on every project. Um, you also start getting referrals from those consultants. Yeah. Um, but yeah, most of our work is is... I mean, I would say 100% is referrals and repeat clients. 
Do you ever um, do a lot of proactive marketing or proactive kind of we want to we want to have you know uh, work in say hospitality? For yeah, example, no, we do. Or you want to we move do. into a sector? We, we do. We um, we we want to increase. Um, we want to increase our retail projects right now. Um, we think it's, it's, they're super interesting or I've always found them super interesting. Um, and, you know, and, and working, doing a retail project can entail a lot of things. You could do the prototype or the, or the, the sort of the initial design, you can do the rollouts, you can do, um, where there's a single location or multiple locations, but, but there's sort of small projects. Um, that are sort of very intense and fast. Um, and you're, it's typically for bigger companies, right? So even though the size of the project is small or the footprint of the project is small, the, the sort of the institution or the parent company is, is bigger. Um, and, you know, it lets you be a little bit, um, a little bit looser in terms of, kind of gestures and, and, and design. And it lets you kind of try different materials, different, different strategies that, yeah. that are sort of tougher to, to, to do on kind of bigger and longer projects that, so ideally, you know, you get these kind of waves of kind of bigger projects that take, you know, a handful of years to do. And then you just kind of get these, these kind of short waves on smaller ones. Um, and that's how we, that's, that's why we take smaller projects, right? To kind of fill in those gaps um, and and to let us, on the short term, try different things and 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 also educate ourselves in other mm. project types that we might necessarily not be well versed in. Um, so that's so so we do do proactive um, marketing, but I mean almost a hundred percent of our projects Got come, it. come through referrals what would you say have has been some of the largest or most profound if you like business insights that you've gotten since 2016 since when you kind of you, you know went into it full time to to now or f- um one of the things that i did not expect. I mean, I sort of knew it was going to be the case, but I didn't expect how hard it was going to hit me. Was that the sort of the buck stops with you mm. as as the as the boss, right? Um, you know, even though I worked with you know large teams and, and other kind of larger offices and stuff, and, and sort of at a project level the buck stopped with me, but there was always a partner. There was always a principal. There was always somebody just kind of overlooking um, and making sure that, you know, the sky didn't fall. Um, In this case, that's me. Not only I'm doing that, but I'm also sort of on the ground doing, doing the projects. And one of the things that, one of the drivers to when I started the office was that, is you know as you get older and have more experience and and sort of grow within the hierarchy of an office the kind of the less architectural work you do right you do you you do more management you do more business development you do more outreach and kind of all of that um and and something and i was you know and and what I like to do is draw, be in the field and all of that. Um, so I was in the office, I was kind of losing that, right? Because I was becoming too expensive to be doing all of that and be competitive. So one of the things that yeah. we can do in a small office is that it allows me to, to keep drawing and keep going to the site and keep, you know, figuring out how to resolve problems, both on paper and in the field. Um, so that's one quality that, that I missed before that was sort of a big driver for having a smaller office. Got it. Um, it, it's interesting how you say the, the, the buck stops with you, the, the kind of ultimate yeah. responsibility yeah. 
everything lies with you and you know it's not uncommon that whenever there's a success in the business the success is attributed to all the team members and everyone and all the employees and they're the ones that have created it and then yeah, yeah. when when it doesn't work out and there's a problem when it hits then, the fan yeah then it, well, yeah exactly it's it's on you yeah no and, and i think that that and there's there's been a handful of times that i've you know shit is at the fan and yeah. It, it definitely shakes your confidence um, yes. for a little bit. And it definitely makes you rethink a couple of things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously, you know, there's a saying that my parents used to tell me all the time. It's like, nobody learns by somebody else's mistakes. Right? So, so it's a matter of just sort of picking yourself up, understanding what you did, understanding what you didn't do. Or how can you have done it differently? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, nobody gets hurt, and you know you learn from the experience, and yeah. you use it going <laughs> forward. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 really stressful. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a stress that I had never experienced in real time, and, and it's, it's it's pretty brutal. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember um, a mentor of mine once said, you don't, uh, no one ever looks good whilst they're learning. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's, there's, there's that kind of, you know, when you're running, when you're running an architecture business, there's all these different moving components and obviously your name's the one on, on the, above the door, yep. the ultimate responsibility, yeah. um, yep. you know, is with you yeah. and with an increasingly litigious society, particularly you guys in the U S yeah, is, there's, particularly there's, in New York. Lot, it's a lot. Particularly in New York and particularly in multifamily projects. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. You have to be, you know, you have to be on top of your game every single day. Mm -hmm. um, how have you, how, how, how do you kind of uh, delegate that sort of responsibility amongst the team? It's real. it's, re how do you it's really hard. It's really hard, and and what you do is that you 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 know you 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 distribute work or you distribute responsibilities to what you think the abilities of that person is, um, mm -hmm. and then kind of hope for the best. Um, yeah. But you always sort of have to be. You know, it, again, the book stops you, right? You have to, before something goes out, you, you have to double check. Um, you know, and sometimes what that means is that, you know, the person who's doing the work, you know, finishes at six, seven o'clock at night, that thing is due at the end of the day. And, you know, and you're looking at it and you're like, oh, crap, like all of the stuff needs to, and, but you're the one who's got to do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and... And it's 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 also really hard to. The last thing I want to do, as as a mentor and as a um, boss to somebody, is is make them feel bad or or make them feel like they haven't lived up to expectations or any of that. Right? It's like everybody is, everybody's learning. Everybody has a learning curve. Everybody is it's it's mm -hmm. somewhere on that curve, right? So. Um, I, I will blame me most of the time for, for that. Right. Like maybe, yeah. you know, like, Oh, you know, I, I, I gave that person too much or, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's you, right. So if promise is made, promise needs to be kept and ultimately that rests on my shoulders. Yes. Yeah. It's, this is, this is the, the the freedom and the weight if you like yeah. all in all in one that, yeah. that business owners yeah. kind of carry with them and, I, and it's and it's interesting going back to that you know initial um insight that you had uh when you were looking at the fees that you right. know i wasn't thinking i wasn't thinking of you, that yeah <laughs> yeah uh, well ex exactly right. exactly it's sometimes you know we, we can we it, that bit's not often shown exactly. as well yeah in terms no of no no rate. and you yeah it's it's a it's you know and some people that sort of sense of responsibility, some people just kind of shrug it off. Other people take it very, very seriously. Um, yeah. You know, we take our responsibility serious and I probably, I'm probably guilty of taking it a little bit more serious probably than I should. 
But um, but at the end of the day, you know, we we want to do a good job. You know, um, we want to make sure everybody's happy, everything works. Um, and and you know, we don't want to do a half-ass job. Yeah. How was uh, this this virus for you guys? The COVID, the pandemic. Yeah. How did you, did did you was it was it a difficult period or did you find it actually it it made you guys busier or there was a lot of work? Yeah, no, it, it depending was, on which sector you're in. Yeah, I mean, originally, originally it was. I mean, like everybody else, we were sort of in shock, both personally and professionally. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like what what is this really going to turn into? Um, and there were in in New York construction stopped um after a little bit we were able to do some things under special like emergency um kind of work permits right um and we had we had one building that first building that that we were doing um it was i don't know maybe two-thirds through construction um, you know, and the, the developer has a timeline, a budget, investors, you know, with, with a plan that you're going to sell units at, at X date. Um, so we have to very quickly figure out how to insert ourselves in this process. Excuse me. And, and how can we be, how, where can we help the most in order for, in this specific project to get these emergency work permits and so on. At the same time, the, the, basically the sky was falling around us in terms of, yeah. in terms of colleagues that were getting laid off because all the projects stopped. Right. And consultants that were, that we were close with that were no longer available. Um, because the company had gone out of business or because that person was no longer there. Um, so there was a lot of kind of re-piecing some of the, some of the relationships um, while at the same time freaking out about like, okay, well, what are the next X amount of years going to look like? Right. So what it turned into for us was basically not saying no to any project that came in. Because we didn't, we didn't know, right? So we we had um, we were working through um, a thirty unit uh, renovation project, a rental building, and but that was basically the only thing we had, you know, finishing the construction of the other one. Um, so it was it was a very it was very stressful because we didn't really know what what was going to what the next couple of years would would be like. Um, that yeah. very quickly turned into us being getting, being very busy um, mm-hmm. for different reasons. You know, people wanted to do projects in their houses and um, people, uh, some other clients received, um, you know, grants or loans or stuff like that. Um, and, and right now we're the busiest that we've ever been. Yeah, um, and and is that is, are you seeing that right across all the sectors that you're that you're working in, or is there specific sectors that are more busy than others? No, I mean I think there, particularly in New York, um, there's there's a tax abatement program, um, which has to do with property taxes, that ends that sunsets next year, and it's and it's a program right. and it's a program that gets renewed every. I forget how long it is. I think it's like five or 10 years. Um, But every time it sunsets, it, um, you don't, you don't necessarily know what the requirements are to belong to the program. Um, So the current program ends uh, June of this year. Um, So the multifamily sector in New York right now is super, super, super busy. Because all you know, there's a there's a lot of developers that want to be able to take advantage of the program, um, and in particular this year there was a change in mayor and the change in governor in New York State and so on. Um, so there was the program is going to get renewed. Like I don't think people 
had a doubt on that, but there was a real uh, unknown quantity and what it was going to look like, right? So a lot of people were trying to cram in before before this deadline. Um, so in particular, that's that's really busy. Um, we've also seen um, the retail space uh, incredibly busy, um, right? As well. Um, so it just it always it always seems like there's a frenzy in New York, but um, <laughs> you know, it's New York. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, but but we talk to other colleagues that either have their own smaller offices or or working bigger, and everybody's just up to the eyeballs of work. It, 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 now, retail is obviously a very interesting sector that's kind of going through a, a renaissance in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's going through a lot of volatile uh, moments there. What, what do you think some of the opportunities are for architects in, in retail at the moment? Because obviously we've, we've seen retail take a real hammering from online purchasing right. and, and you know, people aren't necessarily going to stores anymore to purchase things. They're going for something else, yeah, and it, which actually leaves a good opportunity for architects. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a good opportunity um, because you, you – st- stores still need some sort of physical presence, right? Mm-hmm. The question is what do you use that physical footprint for? Right. Um, I think the, the, the sort of the brand specialists will tell you that it's the, the, that it's the perfect spot to transfer the brand into something else. Right. So whether that is combining the combination of programs, right. Um, like if you have, um, you know, if you have a sneaker store to, combine it with some fitness classes or, um, you know, if you have like an adventure store or a camping store to put a rock climbing wall on it, or, you know, the, the, what we've seen is that the, they become gathering places for that create, not necessarily a cult following, but like the sort of their own tribe. Um, yeah. and, and it's, and, and people do, depending how, how um, much of an enthusiast you are in relationship to what that that brand does, um, you are looking for that space to share that that experience or to share that that common interest with somebody else. Um, so I think the physical presence is still important, um, but it might be more it might be something that's more specialized. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause you can always, you, you know, like it's not, um, you're always are going to be able to get things, whatever it is that you want on Amazon or, or, you know, target or whatever online. Um, but there is still, I think the need for if you're a snowboarder or if you're a skateboarder or if you play tennis or if you're into cooking, right. To go somewhere and, and and share that passion or that interest with like-minded group of people. Yeah. Yeah. So that so that's I think that's the that's the most positive thing or the silver lining we we see on this is that and you see it on on Apple stores um, that they're becoming more like public and civic space as opposed to mm. as opposed to something else, right? They become a container for people to share ideas and to to sort of share their interests, um, you know, while buying a thing or two. Right. Um, but they have, they have that capacity, which is super, super interesting. Yes. No, I love, I love that as an idea that, yeah, they've got the capacity to become civic, civic spaces. What's the rest of 2022 got in store for you? The rest of 2022, we're still in March. There's a long way to go. Um, 2022, um, we, well, we're super busy. Um, but I think 2022 is, will be a pivotal year for us. Um, we are, for a couple of reasons, um, we're, we keep growing, which is great. Um, and in addition to that, um, 
we have a handful of kind of bigger projects that um, that shake our confidence a little bit, but we think we can, mm -hmm. you know, we think we're the right, we think we're the right people at the right moment with the right client and the right team to, to execute them. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully 20 years from now or 10 years from now, we'll look back at 2022 to say, Oh yeah, that was, that, you know, 2016 was that 2022 is when things really started cooking. Love it. Brilliant. I think that's the perfect place for us yeah. to conclude the conversation. Eugene, thank you yeah. so much for sharing your insights with uh, Multiflaming Residential, the growth of your your practice, um, and the, the 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 experience that people go through as being practice owners and, and leaders of a business. So thank you very much. You. It was a delight speaking. Yeah, with you're you. welcome. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.